Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. It's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to have you all here this afternoon for this um, SMS uh, extension on digital platforms and ecosystem that I have the pleasure to uh, co-organize with uh, uh, Professor Pinar Oskan uh, from um, Oxford Side Business School. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Professor Annabel Gower from the University of Surrey. Uh, I'm a professor in digital economy at the business school and the director of the Center of Digital Economy. Uh, we are very privileged to have two uh, wonderful panels this afternoon. And uh, Professor uh, Pinar Oskan will be moderating the first one, which is going to happen between now and an hour and 15 from now. And the title is um, Digital Platforms and Patterns of Disruption Across Industries. Pinar is going to tell you more about that and about her panelists. Then we will have a half an hour break. And then we will start at 3.45 British time for a second panel, which I will be moderating on digital platforms, economic and social impact, and the changing regulatory landscape. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, invite now Pinar to, to welcome you and to tell you more. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Annabelle. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be with all of you and to see such great turnout. Um, I see a, a bit of noise in the background. If I can ask uh, whoever is not speaking to, to mute themselves, that would be wonderful. Um, and also to uh, switch to speaker view, just so that you see our panelists when they speak. This is a regular Zoom, it's not a webinar, so it will be great to, to have all of that. Um, uh, Emma and Martin are, are our coordinators, and um, if, if, if there's any, any issue, uh, they are in the meeting and you can chat with them privately if you cannot hear, if there is anything. Otherwise, please try to keep your video on as usual and, uh, and also uh, keep yourselves muted. The, the way to ask questions will be to, to put them in the chat, either put the, put the question itself in the chat, that will be preferred, but also you're a, you should be able to say, you know, I'd like to ask a question and then take the word. And we will be coordinating the questions in the second half of our, each of the panels. So the way that this is going to work is that we have um, our, pan our panelists who are a, a mix of um, industry and um, academic individuals who are experts in the field and we will be talking about in this first panel we will be talking about disruption um, across industries by the platform business model and so um, obviously it will be too difficult and we could take all day to to discuss how platforms are taking over different kinds of industries but we have tried to together with annabelle we tried to uh, pick a few in order to give you a good overview so what we have uh, we have um, entertainment and that will be covered by uh, Will Page, who um, is one of the, the key individuals who worked at Spotify. And uh, we have Shaz Ansari from um, uh, Cambridge. And then we also have uh, transportation, which is one of the uh, key sectors that has been disrupted. And here we have, uh, as a, our an academic, we have Michael Jacobides from LBS. And then we have um, Santos Rao from Uber as well as we have a uh, Simon Arbutno, who is uh, a consultant working in the area of uh, transportation. Then we also have finance and uh, finance is going to be covered by me. Uh, we also had um, a, a banker with us. Unfortunately, he just informed me yesterday that he became the CEO of a new FinTech company, which is wonderful for him, but unfortunately he's unable to, um, to uh, join. I will be covering finance. And then we have uh, Dr. Hakan Ozalp, who will be talking about another set of regulated industries, which are increasingly being disrupted by uh, platforms. And uh, those are healthcare and education. So it's a very packed program. Each of our speakers has about five minutes to talk about these things, either with or without slides. And uh, you're free to, to write your reactions and your questions. And then in the second half of the panel, we will be talking about all of those things. So without further ado, let's start with some entertainment. And if I can ask um, Will Page to, uh, to, to unmute himself and to, to give us an overview of um, the, uh, the disruption and the change transformation of the music industry with the entry of, um, of uh, uh, platforms, including Spotify. Will, great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, in five minutes, how do you do this? Let's think. I think the real message that has to be got across in the context of this platform discussion is that Spotify beat piracy at its own game. Here's my point. 
20 years ago, what was the consumer doing? They were going to Napster or here in Europe, Winamp, and accessing all the world's music illegally. 20 years later, what are they doing? They're going to the internet and accessing all the world's music legally. And what Spotify did was build something that was better than stealing, and then the people came across. Very important historical context here. Firstly, most of the big piracy services, not that anyone on this panel and this audience ever used them, but the big piracy sites, the Pirate Bay, Utah, and Kazar were all Swedish. Spotify came from Sweden out of the hotbed of piracy. So the intention was to beat those piracy sites with something superior and go and get a license from the record labels so we could pay artists and songwriters. And that's the journey of success the business has been on. But I think the key thing to make clear in academic conferences, a lot has changed, but not a lot has changed. The consumer is still accessing content, only this time they do it legally as opposed to illegally. Some other points to explore before I come back to the market PowerPoint, core to the theme of the session. Um, of course, the business is recovering. You've seen the American music industry grow at double digit rates for the past four years. Very few media industries could claim that success. Um, the business is pretty much 10% off where it used to be at the millennium. So it's gonna reach new peaks very soon. But there's also more artists and more songwriters. So you've had an explosion in supply, more songs, 40,000 new songs being uploaded onto streaming services every single day. Repeat, 40,000 new songs every single day. More artists, about four and a half, five million on the service. More songwriters, collecting societies are growing their membership. So you've got more money around, but one of the reasons why you get a lot of criticism of streaming is there's even more mouths to feed. There's a double dynamic there. More money, the business is recovering, but even more creators who need to be fed from that money and that leads to some rather awkward division as well. Quick point on COVID, I've published some work on this, which we'll make sure is circulated to everyone uh, joining on the impact of COVID on the music industry. It's two key points for me here. Firstly, it's like two ships passing each other in the night. On one side, we have the live music business, which has completely imploded. And the other side, we have the streaming business, which is like our stay at home stock. It's never had it so good. So we have this discontinuity almost effect of streaming is going really great during the COVID crisis. Stocks of streaming services are going through the roof as well. Whereas in live business, there is no touring. Taylor Swift should have been touring the world this summer. She's not, but she has put out an album to fill in the gap. And um, just on that as a shameless self plug this weekend, I've managed to land the most exciting job in the world. I'm working with Billie Eilish on her live streaming event tomorrow, 11 o'clock British time. Possibly the biggest live streaming concert in the history of the internet. So the fact you've got this discontinuity between recorded doing really well, live imploded, you're now seeing innovation in between using live streaming platforms to fill that gap. And there's a fascinating case studies for students and academics to explore in that. Last point Pina asked me to discuss uh, was market power. I think it's worth finishing up with a very brief summary of the Apple tax debate. It relates to some of the other companies on this panel. Spotify is at the heart of it. Essentially, if you pay for Spotify on Spotify's website, you pay $9.99 a month. If you go to the Apple App Store and use in-app purchase, IAP, you're gonna find yourself paying $12.99 a month. Why? Because Apple imposes a 30% tax on the fee, so Spotify rolls that tax on top of the cost. And that's been a debate for the past six, seven years even, and it doesn't go away. Two sides of the story. The side from Spotify says, this is monopolistic and abuse of power, it's anti-competitive, Apple is making more money out of Spotify than Spotify is, which is mathematically correct. The other side is to say, wait, Apple's charging a one size fits all price. It's not discriminating, which is you no know, pro competition. It's allowing access for everyone. And equally for gaming providers where it's a one shot purchase, not a recurring purchase. If you're a games developer and Apple's gonna take 30%, that you don't need a publisher anymore. It's quite a lucrative value chain. So there's two sides to that story. I wanna stay impartial for the sake of discussion here, but as the other companies come up, I'm sure this, this topic of platforms and market power will reoccur. And the Apple tax is a really good case study to, uh, to consider. So just to recap, what's changed, not a lot from the consumer's perspective, everything from the platform's perspective, people are going to access music legally, not illegally. A huge explosion in money, but an even bigger explosion in songwriters and artists, which means you've got more mouths to feed. Um, the, the live effect of COVID has seen a collapse in concerts, but an explosion in live streaming. And then wrapping up again, just think about the Apple tax as a recurring theme for the rest of this afternoon session as well. Back to you, Pina.
Thank you so much, Will, and this was uh, perfectly on time and you even have a few seconds to spare. So if I may, I'm going to ask you one question maybe to conclude your uh, uh, presentation, which is, where do you see the future? Where do you see the future? Um, so it's, it's fascinating to think about how far this could go. I'll quote Eddie Q from Apple here, where he said there's 8 billion people on this planet and not many of them don't like music. Flippant remark, but actually has some meaning, like how many people don't like music? Uh, there's a billion people paying for television in the world today and only, what, 400 million paying for music? It should be easier to pay for music than it is for television. So you can see there's a lot of runway for growth. That said, uh, my most recent work in Billboard magazine questions the saturation point. At what point does every man, woman, cat, dog and pet hamster have a subscription streaming service? And I think that point is happening now in Scandinavia and it's potentially going to happen quite soon in the United States as well. Uh, you've got so many streaming services at such scale. You've also got Sirius XM with 35 million subscribers. And the way that I wrapped the Billboard article, and again, we'll get this article out to your students, is when do streaming services go from herbivores to carnivores? The point being, all we've had for the past 10, 15 years is Spotify's up, Amazon's up, Apple's up, YouTube's up. At what point does Amazon grow by pushing someone else down? We haven't got to that market stealing stage yet, but I think it's going to happen soon. Thank you very much, Will, for this um, great overview. Um, now we'll go to Shaz Ansari uh, from Cambridge, who's going to, who has done quite a bit of work in, in the entertainment industry as well. And he will give us his views on uh, uh, the historical, the present, and the future. Thank Shaz, you. Thank you, Bernard, you. Thank, thank you, Annabelle, for inviting me. And thank you, Will, for that excellent start. Um, I was hot me back to the days of Napster. I'm old enough to remember, an uh, excited user of Napster. And uh, loved your point about every hamster having a streaming service. It just made me laugh out loud. But thanks, thank you so much. Um, uh, connecting to entertainment, and Pinar asked uh, us, us to speak about entertainment. I thought I'd connect it to make it a bit wider, talk about infotainment, which connects with the uh, news uh, as well as uh, entertainment. So I thought I'll uh, cover a bit of that as well. Um, can I share some slides, uh, Pinar? Is that okay? Okay, all right. So uh, let me see if you if you see them. Uh, okay, can everyone see them? Perfect, okay, great. Um, let me put in, uh, so let me, this is a project with my, uh, uh, a PhD who's been in, uh, worked with Hollywood, the guy on the right, Stephen Lyle and uh, Florian, uh, both at Cambridge, I'm at the business school, do work at um, engineering. And it's been a fascinating project working with uh, Stephen, who's been a technologist, a banker, as well as a, a, a media guy who's been worked, who's worked with Hollywood. So it's been great to have him do an MBA and now a PhD at, at Cambridge. So this broadcast news prime for disruption. This is his part of his PhD. Um, and um, it's interesting that there's a, Proof of concept developed by Fran Hofer Institute and Cambridge University for a hypothetical stream news platform, iWit. And you might have, um, just to connect back what's already happening, there's a platform called Correspondence. Some of you might have seen it. It's an, they pitched themselves as antidote to the fake news pandemic. And it's an online platform for unbreaking news committed to collaborative constructing and ad-free journalism. And there's no longer view the readers as passive consumers of information, but as active contributors of expertise. I encourage you to just check it out, the decorrespondent.com. Um, it's a website and it tells more about, it was free and now they have a paid uh, subs a subscribe, uh, subscription service as well. Um, having said that, this is, uh, this is important because as we know, the last major disruption of broadcast news was CNN. That goes back to, uh, to a while, uh, you know, it's been a long time. 1980 it was launched in with the introduction of the 24 hour news. So, um, and now you've known the issue with fake news um, right up with the elections coming up. We hear this all the time, see that trust is going down some regarding, uh, you know, uh, news, pandemic news. Just look at the uh, percentages there that we, uh, the level of trust in our news has, has decreased considerably. Um, if you look at these different media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, LinkedIn, you see the level of, um, of uh, you know, as a sign of some political election, you know, a, a distrust of social media that this reflects. Uh, again, uh, the fake news arms race and the acad academic literature is catching up. I mean, there have been more and more uh, countermeasures to combat fake news. And um, there have been articles written up to, you know, for, for this purpose. Again, um, um, uh, annual cost to global economy is 78 billion. 
So um, I'm, I think this platform model is 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 going to take over a more and more space in the uh, news and um, and information uh, space, as we have seen it in the entertainment space. And these platforms are very promising views of you know at least combating some of the problems that we are finding with trust in the level of news. Um, Pinar also asked me to, to talk a little bit about the uh, video streaming industry that I've worked with, with TiVo and all those companies earlier on. That's how I got to know Stephen. And there you might have just heard this news a couple of days ago, uh, Quibi shutting down six months after launch, having spent $1.8 billion. So you put together a former person from Hollywood as head of a startup, along with the former CEO of HP. You ask them to start a startup for uh, video streaming of small clips, just like uh, TikTok but this time for uh, content which is designed, such as Netflix and mobile phones. Uh, they say it was a problem of the coronavirus, yes, but it was also a bad model. They just never caught on subscribers. And some people say, well, incumbents don't get it. They, they tried two, two billion, this $1.8 billion spent in about six months, all down the drain had to shut down. So um, that's not to say that incumbents can never do it, but it's just a sign that it's difficult. Remember the golden era from Hollywood, um, and as you can see, uh, this has changed with uh, you know the uh, modern era with the age of franchises, era of never cycling reruns, recycled productions, superheroes, and then you have the streaming video arms race, which is going on at the moment. And if you look at it, you have HBO, you have Netflix, you have I mean you have such a wide variety of uh, streaming platforms, and you might see some um, consolidation happening in, in this space. Uh, but of course, you could argue that uh, there's also this competition from Silicon Valley and, and in Will touched upon Apple as a company there. But you, of course, there is that, uh, you know, that um, angle as well. And you see, you know, Google, the outsiders, so-called with the, uh, you know, the likes of Google and Amazon that are entering this space as well. So you have um, Netflix. I just thought I'd put one slide about what they do is this whole stack of content, Netflix stack distribution and then uh, you know the whole model, sorry, is um, playback is designed around this platform, which Disney Plus is trying to um, emulate. Which um, again, as you know, Disney launched a platform called Disney Plus, and that's my last slide. And they just re recently announced this reorganizing where they want to integrate digital much more with uh, Disney's other products, so that it's not like a standalone Disney Plus and uh, completely untethered from. Disney Corporation's other offerings that they have that they're known for. So this is again their attempt to uh, play in this space. Incumbents are of course uh, trying to catch up, trying to uh, play this uh, uh, you know interdependency ecosystem uh, uh, game as well. Um, how this space unfolds will it's an interesting um, battle ahead. Um, but I'm, I'll I'll be happy to sort of take your questions, take your uh, things, and I'll I'll end here, uh, Pinar. And thank you again for inviting me. Thank you, Shaz, and again, right on time. Um, so here we we have seen a little bit about music and entertainment and 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 the way that the the platforms have also evolved. Um, Shaz, maybe the same question to you now with Disney Plus entering and Netflix and, and also maybe in light of net net neutrality debates and how each different state in the U.S. is now uh, thinking about net neutrality for their own uh, for their own state. Um, where do you see the future? Yes, I mean, there will be a lot of people who, who, who study governance much more than I do. So uh, I let them uh, talk about the, the governance, as, I mean, especially the regulatory part of it. But um, I see some uh, consolidation happening. I think uh, Netflix has held its own, but it's still uh, a challenging battle. I mean, I know they're big in India. I know some friends in India and how active Netflix is in designing content so that it doesn't get left behind on the content side of things. And I think incumbents, just like in every other industry, I mean, look at Walmart trying so hard with Fizzy Digital and trying to catch up with Amazon. And actually they did better on Prime Day than Amazon, some of their marketplace sellers. So it's interesting to see how other uh, companies are trying to uh, enter the space and it's not a winner takes all dynamic necessarily. Uh, so it's, it's again, at the end of the day, who does it best for customers offers that, um, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a whole uh, bunch of uh, dynamics, but let's see how, how this plays out. So I'd be uh, curious to hear what people's comments are as well. Thank you very much, Shaz. So we have a, a few questions as well as a very lively debate between uh, Michael and Andrew on, on the chat, which I won't comment on right now. Um, 
our next uh, uh, sector to tackle is uh, transportation and we'll start with uber santosh rao from uber will give an overview of how where the uh, transportation sector is going and how pl platforms are becoming dominant in it santosh great to have you here sure. thank you thank you for having me um and excited to take part in this uh, discussion um i'll just quickly introduce myself i'm a research scientist at uber um on my day-to-day, -day, I sort of like look at the impact of our business, our rights business on um, a city's mobility landscape. So how are we impacting um, congestion, car ownership, car use, the automotive sector, and all of that stuff. Um, so that's my day-to-day. -day. And uh, Pinar asked me to like speak about two or three uh, sort of transformative trends that we're seeing in the transportation and automotive, uh, automotive space um, that I think are gonna shape the next five, 10, 15 years. Um, so I'll maybe just quickly go over those. Um, so, the, the, so the first one that um, uh, I think is really exciting and interesting is what I call the multimodal suite versus the personal car. Uh, some people also talk about it uh, and call it the unbundling of the car. Um, basically, uh, historically what has happened is that the car is an incredibly reliable, safe, comfortable way of fulfilling all your mobility leads. But now these new mobility companies and platforms, so think e-bikes, scooters, uh, car share, ride share, all of these small, small mobility bits and pieces are chipping away at that uh, car. So basically unbundling different use cases. Um, and we're slow, slowly seeing that happen in a more uh, sustained way. And I think it's, a, it's gonna be a very interesting trend looking ahead in terms of how this impacts car use, car ownership, and overall how this changes the mobility fabric of a city. Um, we know that global auto sales uh, have, some say peaked, some say they've just plateaued, but, but we know that at least in the last three, four years, they've plateaued. So it's just gonna be interesting to see how these two sort of like the, the multimodality suit I'm talking about and the personal car, which is, uh, which has by far the most dominant mode share in transportation, uh, how these two play out over the next few years. So that's, in, that's a trend to watch out for. Um, the, the next one is uh, sort of this move urgent move towards a cleaner, more sustainable future that we need to get to. Uh, in the EU, transportation is the only sector which has increased emissions since the 1990s. Every other organized sector has reduced emissions. So there is an urgent need. Um, all the OEMs and all the mobility companies are aware of this. Um, and uh, we just need to bring those numbers down. Um, in, in this space, I think uh, we have to more people need to bike, more people need to walk, more, be more people need to take um, um, more active cleaner modes, but also we just need to get rid of our internal combustion engines in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Electrification is one of the options that's suggested, uh, and we'll see how this plays out. But ride hailing as a sector, and I can speak for ride hailing because I'm in that sector, we feel it has sort of a, a, a unique role to play here because drivers on our platform drive more than the average uh, driver, they um, um, basically use their car more, are more price sensitive, um, and then also have high turnover. So they're buying new cars faster than the average user. So uh, there, there's, a, there's a chance to uh, electrify the ride hail sector first, and then sort of lead that into a flywheel that electrifies the rest of transportation as we know it. So that's the second area to think about. Um, the third and final one is um, automation. This is more longer term, but it's definitely uh, a transformative step change that we're looking at. Um, it is fascinating in the sense uh, that everyone knows it's gonna change travel behavior, but no one can accurately predict for obvious reasons how it's gonna change it. So all the states, companies, everyone involved needs to very closely study this uh, trend and uh, react with policy and market um, um, incentives and initiatives as needed. Um, there, there is a future in which everyone gets their own car because it's straightforward and easy, but that's probably not the future that we want. What we want is a shared uh, future with limited resources that's more sustainable. Um, so as I said, we need to see how this plays out, but this is another longer term trend that is uh, probably going to change travel, be, uh, travel behavior like no other trend. And I'll stop there.
Thank you very much, Santosh. And again, you know, uh, with the same uh, question I can direct to you, maybe. Um, it, uh, with these trends, where do you see Uber going? Um, so on, on the second one, we've made a commitment to um, electrify as soon as possible. Uh, we've sort of like put out a set of things that need to be done by cities for us to reach those targets by 20, but by 2030 in all European and North American cities, we've committed to 100% electric or 100% zero emissions um, um, uh, um, transportation across our platform. On the first one, which is sort of the, the unbundling of the car, that is the mission of the company. It is if we, if we can sort of move away from this car dependent lifestyle, then we can like start designing our cities, not around cars, but around people. Um, so uh, over the course of the next five, 10 years, you will see us again, continue to chip away that, that car use case with different products, different modes, different uh, alternatives, um, and sort of like stack them on top of each other to, as I said, like strengthen this multimodal suit that we have. Um, and then automation, as I said, it's a longer term play. Uh, we have investments in that space, but it's too early to say how that's gonna play out. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Santosh, for joining us and looking forward to also uh, your participation in the panel. I'm sure the audience will have many questions, particularly for you. Now we'll switch over to uh, Simon Arbutno, who is an, a specialist in, um, in Ricardo Consulting. And we worked uh, quite a bit with Ricardo um, over here in the UK in the past. Uh, Simon, really looking forward to, to your perspective as a consultant looking at transportation. Thanks, Pina. can you hear me okay? Beautiful. Yeah, and thank you for making me sound so exotic. It's actually Simon Arbuthnot. The T isn't silent, it's not French, it's Scottish, but great to be here. Um, and it was great to hear, I think, the entertainment view and the view from Uber. Um, I'll give them um, hopefully a five minute view on how the platform environment is coming into the mainstream automotive industry from an OEM and a supply base. So platforms already exist in the automo automobile industry, in the automotive industry. It's effectively the underpinning of the vehicle, what in the old days you might call the chassis. And OEMs concentrate on building a small number of platforms for economies of scale, economies of production, fast product development, flexibility, and also for the ability to share the platform across brands and across OEMs. So as an example, Volkswagen has the MQB platform. That's the Volkswagen Golf, the Audi A3, the Skoda Fabia, the Seat Leon, and all the different derivatives of this vehicle. And in terms of scale that this gives Volks Volkswagen, they produce 5 million MQB platforms each year. And in, in comparison, Renault, only produces 3.8 million across all their vehicles. So this is an incredibly powerful tool. When we're looking at electric and electronic architecture, um, we have um, Autozar, which is an operating system or a runtime environment that is effectively a de facto standard or platform. In the industry, things are gonna become a lot more complex as the last speaker talked about, the move to connected, autonomous, shared and electric vehicles create significant challenges to the whole automotive supply base. Essentially, we're moving from 100 years of experience of hardware to, to software enabled vehicles. So if we look traditionally, perhaps 90% of the value in a vehicle comes from the hardware and 10% from the software. In the future, we're gonna see probably only 40% coming from the hardware perhaps 40% from software and about 20% from content. So it's a significant change. And automotive OEMs are good at bashing metal. They are less good at understanding electrics and electronics. So we're looking at the risk of unsustainable complexity and how you manage that. I'll give you some examples. There might be 100 million lines of code in an S-Class Mercedes. If we look at a level four, level five, fully autonomous vehicle, we could be talking of 350 million lines of code. If you look at the F-35 fighter, best in class fighter jet, there's 6 million lines of code there. So this is huge level of complexity. A modern car could have 100 control units, ECUs. That adds about 40 kilos of weight 
and we're talking about up to five kilometers, five kilometers of cables. So OEMs are trying to reduce complexity by creating a service or software oriented architectures. So they can use their knowledge from the physical platforms to create repeatable and scalable platforms to reduce complexity. Essentially separate the software from the hardware domains, give them agility, give them repeatability, meaning that you don't have to reinvent the software for every new vehicle, reduce reliance on ECU, on control unit suppliers, and create these new revenue streams. So essentially we've gone from, we're moving from a distributed architecture, such as in the MQB Volkswagen platform, with 100 ECUs running all the services and features around the vehicle to much more centralized domain-based, platform-based architecture in the new platforms like the MEB, the Volkswagen Modular Electric Platform. So instead of you're going from 100 separate ECUs to three or five domains. So a domain you're looking after cockpit, after safety, after the powertrain, after the body control. And these domains manage the services and manage the features that the customer wants. Now, this is proving to be very difficult and very costly to the OEMs. Volkswagen Group have hired 10,000 software engineers. And even so, their um, ID platform, their stories of 20,000 ID1s sat in a field waiting for manual software updates. But the key point about this platformization of the electrical and electronic and software platforms is it gives them the ability to add updates quickly, but it also gives them the ability to monetize, to actually sell that platform to other OEMs. So we're seeing the MEB being licensed by Volkswagen to Ford. You're seeing the, prem the premier platform electric, PPE, which is the Porsche and Volkswagen, Porsche and Audi platform, potentially being sold to BMW and Daimler. So again, it's, it's the electronic following the physical world and OEMs trying to create a platform within the electrical electronic architecture to ensure they can meet these challenges in a cost-effective and timely manner. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, this was uh, very complimentary also given that, you know, you've talked about the, the, the OEMs, which, uh, which um, uh, complements what uh, Santosh has um, talked about. Now, maybe one question for you is that this, there's this acronym, which I only learned a couple of years ago, which is CASE, the Connected Autonomous Shared Electric Vehicles, which, uh, you know, is the future that most people agree that uh, the automotive industry is going into. Um, can you tell us, you've talk, talked a lot about the challenges that OEMs are, are facing. Can you tell us a little bit about the ecosystem that, it, that with new players that is emerging, who else is coming into this sector uh, to go to, to this future? I, I, I think that the advent of CASE is, it's, it's a, one of the first, it's one of the biggest shakeups that the industry is going to face. I think it's akin to uh, the 73 oil crisis, um, it's going to bring in a, a huge number of new entrants. I mean, we, we've heard from Uber, but there are multiple ride hailing applications that are emerging. There are multiple different mobility as a service players emerging. I think what it will also do is really shake up the whole, the whole value proposition and the whole value creation stream in the automotive industry. I mean, if you look now, traditionally about 40% of the value comes from the sale of the vehicle. So the OEM is collecting about 40% of that, of that value. We think in the future that will drop to below 30%. And now the, sort of the, the services associated with the vehicle, and I don't mean aftermarket, the other services associated with the vehicle outside of the sale, the aftermarket, the insurance and repair, that's about sort of four percent of the value, and we see that increasing to thirty-six to forty percent. So this is new software, this is digital services, this is ride-hailing services. So within the next ten years, these new services that didn't exist five to ten years ago can be collecting as much of the value from the value chain as the automotive OEMs were collecting five years ago. So it's a huge shake-up with a huge number of new entrants. Some of the big tech firms we all know about, some people we don't, wouldn't have heard about now could be the, the alphabets in 10 years time. So I think for the OEMs, 
and the traditional suppliers, the Bosch's, the Continentals of this world, it's it's a huge shakeup. And I think for many of them, when you add the the the, the, the risk of the global economy from COVID, some of these will be existential. Thank you very much for this, Simon. Now let's move over to our wonderfully tanned panelist, Michael Jacobides from LDS. Okay, all right. Well, before I move into the presentation, if I may enter in discussion mode for just a minute, because I think that it is interesting that we had two presentations that were in theory about the same thing, but fundamentally not, because the notion of platform in uh, the two presentations of Shazad and Simon are not the same thing, because they don't mean the same thing. What Simon is focused on is what engineers understand by platforms, and a part of the literature that is drawing on engineering is, and he thinks about the different platforms that allow people to produce cars. When Shahzad thinks about platforms, uh, sorry, um, sorry, uh, not, not, not Shahz, um, uh, when Santosh uh, thinks about platforms, he thinks about the platforms that connect a variety of different users, drivers and riders. Very different stories. And unfortunately, we have the same world, word. So I will say that there is a risk of confusion. Now, with that, let me launch my presentation because I'll try to give a bit of an overview of what's happening. It's kind of fun as I was uh, thinking about the invitation. I thought that that links a lot of my previous research uh, to what I'm doing right now or what I may be doing later on. Uh, because I think that the point here is if you think about cars of mobility, we shifted from a fairly static structure to a shifting industry architecture to the rise of platforms and ecosystems. And if you think sort of further back, uh, Jean-Paul McDuffie and I had it as uh, the, to the, the, tr the sort of traditional example of saying, look, unlike uh, the computer sector that was erroneously used by people like Bain and other consultants as an example of what would happen in the automobile story, the automobile sector has seen a fairly stable pattern of value distribution among the members. And if you go further down and if you look at the underlying research, you're gonna find all kinds of reasons why there was a stability in the industry architecture. So as far as up until probably the beginning of the 2010s goes, the way that cars were made did not really change much. Interestingly, Tesla also does not change it much. Uh, if anything, it wants to look even more vertically integrated than the traditionalists. But then you start combining that from the cars to mobility. Now that's a different kettle of fish. And what you see is that you see that soon enough, because of mobility, which basically has allowed you to create um, different types of connections and allows you to link different participants, you saw an explosion of excitement and Uber was clearly uh, the company that everyone was looking at, trying to understand why it is so more valuable than many of the automobile companies that had been there for a very long time and fun, unusual things happening from the traditional OEMs who said, oh my God, we have been focusing on doing cars, but the value now is moving to these other parts of mobility. And then you start looking at the OEMs that are moving and are thinking about the equivalent of the over-the-top players, the on-demand platforms, perhaps the digital integrators. And also there was an equivalent or different and causally different um, change in the way that the automobile manufacturers would link to suppliers precisely for the reasons that Simon mentioned, which is that you now have very different types of capabilities that need to be accessed and combined into a car, which is becoming a much more dynamic structure than that. And what you then saw as these things evolved is that there was all kinds of repositioning with the industry architecture of the car becoming more fluid and the traditional demarcations where we know who everyone played and where they were changing over time. And it's a fascinating setting of how and why digital, I would suggest, and uh, uh, my papers at least have uh, hinted as much, as a result of the increasing modularization and the ease of recombination, you're able to do all kinds of stuff. The traditional boundaries go down. It's a free for all. It's an exciting world. People freak out. There's all kinds of value redistribution in expectation of revenues, not by the revenues, interestingly, where people say, oh my God, my value is going to go there. Let me buy this loss-making company at a huge premium, although probably it's going to burn uh, and crash over time. More about that in a moment. Now, what is interesting is there's a lot of stuff that we can look at. And um, recently, 
work with my PhD st student in a tank, looking at how it is that tables turned and the previous pariahs in the industry who were begging for some uh, combination became the hot kids in the block where you had companies like Toyota offering a billion dollars to upstart Grab so that Grab would deem to work with them. And it's a very interesting change that I think that for me has implications because it changes this idea of, oh, this poor um, entrant that comes and is squashed. It's the exact opposite. We have entered in platform markets in cases where the entrant becomes hugely prized and that changes the way that we can comprehend the world. Now, what's happening in terms of the platforms now? Lots of stuff. Let me give you an example of a company that I, I, I've looked at closely, Velocia. What do they do? I, you all know what uh, Uber does, that gets cars, you've used it, or Grab, or whatever you're using, depending on which part of the world you're looking at, or Lyft. What these guys are doing is they say, let's create new platforms uh, that not only provide ridership, but perhaps provide other other benefits. So what Velocia does is it works, for instance, now it works with the city of Miami and it says, we want people to take fewer cars. We will create an app and this app is going to give you rewards if you share cars, if you use public transport, and it's going to give you velos, which allow you to use public transportation because the city wants to organize the management of its traffic and push people to a different way in which they want to combine. So what you now see is this emergence of these new people who are creating these new platforms and ecosystems where they're bringing different partners together from public authorities to private firms, and then they're trying to combined with individuals, gamifying it, changing their experience. And I think that it is quite interesting to see what the variety is. And if you start looking at reports that are telling you about mobility, boy, oh boy, were you going to have a headache. Why? Because you realize that right now there is a competition. And again, you can think about the changing architecture of these platforms of different ways of putting it together. You have logistics as a service. You have fleet as a service. You have rights sharing, the traditional stuff we all know. You have mobility as a service that covers everything from your bike to public transport to getting a car at the edge of public transport and getting you somewhere. And there are different players that are trying to get their own toehold in these different uh, areas. So it's fascinating because I do think that transport is being transformed, mobility is transformed by a number of different ways of slicing and dicing things. Now, let me go back all the way back at the level of the firm. Um, uh, that basically tells you that everyone is trying to get to the holy grail in terms of a comprehensive mobility ecosystem. By the way, this is interesting for companies, it's interesting for cities, it's interesting for um, other public authorities. But if you think about it at the level of the firm, it is not interesting for the firm to just say, I'm going to have mobility. It also needs to make a buck. Let me now have a bit of a clean break and give you a preview of one of the recent papers that uh, something that will appear um, in, a, in, the, in the new paper with Annabelle and Carmelo and with, in a couple of other outputs as well. Michael, before you do, this is fascinating. However, you do have one minute. Okay. Uh, basically, think about what companies do. They build ecosystems, which is multi-product ecosystems bundling different things together. When you do that and you make a bigger and bigger salami, you also need to combine with other firms, which are the multi-product ecosystems, the stuff that we've spoken about in our 2018 firm. So what you see is that companies go trying to grow and then to bring complementers. You see that in Google, you see that in Apple, you see that in transport. So what you see with ride hailing is that unfortunately, it is not going to work as a business model. Uber, sorry, it's massively overvalued. Where can you hope to make some bucks? If you are able to be sticky enough for the customer, combining transport and food and delivery, that and financial services, that is what Grab did. And that is what Uber is doing, deciding that the other spaghetti have not stuck on the wall and it wants to create this more integrated package to be able to lock in the customer that raises issues of competition that the next panel will consider. And now we have an interesting fight for companies, many of which are still burning cash that they are either borrowing or getting through the capital market with no clear end in sight, other than the hope that they will magically create the right scope and be successful. Uh, result? Uh, stick around. It's a really interesting setting. So with that, I see the floor.
Thank you very much, Michael, for this fantastic overview. And uh, it's also a great uh, Velocity app is really, really interesting to look at in a sense, a mega platform that integrates with the institutional environment, which is one of the ways in which these uh, either car sharing or ride hailing platforms really have to, one of the challenges they face is, you know, how to integrate into the institutional environment and work with regulators in a way that both benefits the regulator and also benefits the consumer. So fascinating, thank you very much. Now, in the interest of time, I'll move on to uh, the regulated industry, highly regulated industries, I should say. And our next guest is Hakan Ozalp, who's going to talk about healthcare and education. Welcome, Hakan. Hello, thank you very much Pnar, for the introduction and for, for inviting me together with Annabelle. I mean, after our fascinating I think, presentations, all of them are amazing. I think now the talk has also naturally come to highly regulated industry. So what I will talk is mostly about the big tech entries, the GAFAM basically firms, entries into education and healthcare. And meanwhile, I will also touch upon a bit on, you know, let's say startups or the new kind of platforms that organically grow in these industries. So what is interesting about these highly regulated industries is that if you go back 2016 and read the, the fascinating book by the Parker et al on platform revolution, they will note that, well, you know, we see some markets that are not yet disrupted by platform model. And the first basically example is the highly regulated industries such as healthcare or also education. And now actually we see that these markets are getting disrupted. But what is different and interesting in these markets is that you have a highly connected ecosystem with many actors being a mix of state, institutional and private actors. And they have also a set of rules and laws they have to comply with. And generally you also have basically privacy laws going around both in education and healthcare. So this actually makes it quite a, a different and, and in a way a high entry barrier setting for platform business model. Now, the dilemma is many states around the world are facing high costs and, and, and challenges given their healthcare and education systems are basically not able to carry the, the high costs of both healthcare and education. And I think with the COVID situation, this whole trend has become much more apparent. And what is interesting is that what in our observation is that the big promise of platforms actually in these highly regulated markets has come through the, the more recent emphasis on data and AI machine learning technologies, because the customization basically, the promise of getting a customized uh, symptom and diagnosis or a, an education program is super valuable. And, and although it's ideal, it may solve actually many of the problems. Now, what we see here is that, therefore, actually, many of these big tech or GAFAM players are rushing after data collection and individualized means of data collection. Like if you are Apple, you try to leverage your hardware to collect this data. And if you are Google, you know, you have many tentacles, if you wish. So you have so many data points. You try to enter with new activities to collect even more data and then maybe do an agreement with NHS to also collect a mass whole millions of you know, UK patient data, so you can just add them to your existing data set. And that's what we see is that basically for basically to deliver this big promise, the most established big tech players are the ones actually that are most ripe to act on. But the challenge is that actually, now you see with all these regulatory talks going around, these are the exact basically players that regulators were already concerned with right, given their market power, their practices. And now these same players have this dual role. On one hand, they say that, hey, we can deliver the promise. We have this existing big data and we have basically analytics capabilities. And you know what, we also do killer acquisitions, by the way. So if there are these organic startups, you know, doing good business, we are anyways, you know, acquiring them in a while. But on the other hand, these are the same players you don't want to hand in your data, like Facebook promising you something about healthcare would be, well, quite questionable, I would say, for, for also many state actors, right? And this is what we are observing. So on one hand, we, we see eventually that these players are entering as now layers, just as a layer where they kind of exchange data capabilities and analytic services in exchange of collecting data. And we see that in a way, the central primary actors like the hospitals, like the doctors or the teachers, will lose actually some of their power over the long run because some of the recommendations now will come from these systems, but it will be a long battle. 
And, and it is also very interesting to see how this will unfold because these platforms may have the capabilities, but their practices have not always been, you know, uh, basically transparent. And I think that will be something we will observe over time, but at least uh, for the foreseeable future, now we see finally healthcare and education being disrupted. So I think in sake of time, probably I will end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hakan. And maybe um, a question uh, for you as, as you're looking a bit closer into these industries that we see quite a, a few industry specific platforms, just like in other sectors, but also here industry specific platforms that tackle certain challenges. And in fact, you know, uh, those who us who uh, teach online are having existential questions about uh, whether we are needed or not in, in 10 years from now. Can you tell us a little bit about this, uh, the dynamics between industry specific versus GAFAM players in these regulated environments and how regulators are seeing and differentiating between these? So, well, thanks, Munar. I think there are there are two ways, I think, to look at it. I think the industry-specific platforms were, in a way, they were more organic, so they get less attention when they were founded, right? You were, let's say, in healthcare, right? You have 23andMe and or patients like me, something like that. And these platforms were organically growing within these, basically, industries before, let's say, uh, big tech players had, had really pushed on and mass entering these. But I think there are these two things that, that can explain the, the reason why the big tech players are still so dominant. One, the fact that many of these smaller, like let's say industry platforms, they end up getting some ownership share by, by big tech players. I mean, 23andMe has, has basically its first investor is Google. Uh, and then also, if you think that eventually the, they become end up being basically users or complementers back again, these big tech players. Right, because they will end up using, let's say, even in the like in the Netflix example, right? You go up and end up using Amazon Clouds, you end up using Google Clouds, and also your data set, your data capabilities will never be at the same size, scale, and scope as, as Google is. So you may be very specialized, and that's important because right, the, the AI, AI machine learning are very targeted technologies, so you don't have general AI yet. But still, I think the size, scale, scope matters, especially in platform industries, as we know, in platform markets. And that's the reason why I think the organic players are also somehow a bit dependent on the longer run on these big tech players. And just to close off, I would think that also the important thing is that the schools and hospitals are also end up maybe being complementers to platforms if, if basically these things are not intervened on the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Hakan. And again, these are all uh, um, very important and controversial issues when it, when it comes to these basic services that we consume uh, for ourselves and for our family. Now, the uh, last uh, sector that we're going to tackle, and I'm going to take this role on as, uh, as our finance person um, has, um, has um, other very important things to do right now, the rise of platforms in banking. And this, this fits well with some of the, the studies that, uh, that I have been doing lately as part of the um, Oxford FinTech um, initiative that we have started. Um, let me see if I can share my screen in order to get started. Hope you can see uh, this uh, well. The, the first thing that, um, that, that I want to say is um, the Obviously, the, the reason why we're all here is that, you know, if platform business models are, are disrupting different sectors. And as, as Hakan also said at the beginning, regulator, regulated, highly regulated uh, sectors have, uh, have um, stayed outside of this kind of disruption for a long time. However, um, lately, we see this uh, picture changing, and one of the ways in which it's, it's changing is also we see this in banking. However, in banking, it's not so much that regulators are finding themselves in need of responding to, to, to these changes uh, to, to the sector, uh, to the competitive landscape, which will be one of the questions we will address in uh, Annabelle's uh, panel after this one. But regulators have actually been proactive in banking, in making sure that uh, not necessarily the platform model can come in, but that data is at the center of the offering. One of the reasons why banking had not been an innovative sector is because when consumer data resides inside large established organizations, it's difficult for a new entrant to actually offer something interesting to this consumer because they don't know anything about the consumer and the consumer is wary to share this kind of data. 
And in order to solve this problem, regulators have actually introduced, starting in the UK and EU, uh, they announced in 2015, and since 2018, we have this set of uh, regulations called Open Banking or PSD2 in uh, Europe, and then now they are being replicated across the world in Australia, Brazil, Canada, Turkey. What we see is a new set of uh, regulatory schemes that allow us consumers to get ownership of our data, in particular financial data, payments and uh, transfers. What this means practically is that if before um, this regulation, you were all only able to get to your assets and data using your proprietary mobile app, only like if I'm with HSBC, then I can just go to the HSBC app. What I can do now is if um, a player like, um, you know, Hakan has a the new startup and he wants to analyze the data in order to give me a better mortgage rate, then I am able to tell to my bank, I would like to share my data. And this happens electronically and the bank doesn't even get to negotiate that with me. This is in essence what this regulation is. It tells you that, you know, as a consumer, you have a, you know, ownership of your data and therefore you can actually share it with third parties who you give consent to. Of course, they need to be licensed and everything. It's not just everyone who can ask for this data. What this means for consumers is really that our data can be analyzed in order for us to get more tailored services. If I you know, used to travel a lot before COVID, then I might get better deals in my you know, uh, airline miles. Or it could be that you know, I, need, I have a certain shopping pattern and that can uh, give me rewards in certain ways. So all of this basically means that we have a lot more choice. And in fact, um, one of my favorite things to look at sometimes is how um, a traditional bank services, which you see here, this is an HSBC website, although it doesn't look like it right now, for every single banking service that HSBC or Lloyd's or Bank of America provides, there's actually a you know, zillion of different fintechs around the world that target just this area. So this could be savings, this could be lending, this could be international money transfers, you name it fintechs are coming into this uh, market because they can now access your data with your consent. So there's an influx of innovation and where platforms come into this business is actually exactly here. So a lot of these companies, which are fintechs, you know, startups that tackle just one, one of these areas, and some of them are here in this picture, they struggle. The reason why they struggle is consumers are really um, conservative when it comes to finance and we have trouble sharing our data and our assets because these are sensitive and in fact one of the first things that somebody has told me in banking and this was coming from a traditional bank was that Pinar you're much more likely to get a divorce than to change your bank in your lifetime which I thought was quite depressing but here you go consumers don't, are sticky they don't uh, change their um, bank often and this is what banks have been banking on basically so these new players they struggle to get customers' attention. They struggle to get customers' trust. Even if they sign up a million or two million um, customers per country, this doesn't mean that they're getting enough revenue because most people are just putting a bit of money to play around there rather than getting their life savings as well as their uh, salary deposited, which means low average uh, revenue per user. And in addition, in this environment of low uh, resources and not being able to scale up quickly because they don't get enough money, what's happening is that they have to make choices in terms of their technology investment. In order to capture us users, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, you know, we need to make this app really attractive. We need to make it safe, obviously, but also very attractive. However, banking has a huge back, uh, back structure as well, back infrastructure. And at that bank back end, typically they have to rely on third parties, which creates some of these situations like the one you see on the slide, you know, some of the hottest fintech firms going down, you know, for an entire weekend of not being able to reach your money or making transfers, et cetera, which really lowers the uh, customer's uh, trust as well. So what we see overall is that fintechs struggle um, because they can't get enough customers quickly. Uh, we see incumbent banks, the, the traditional banks of the world struggle because as we know, you know, as academics, uh, they're inertial and they have difficulties embracing innovation. There's a third type of player though, which doesn't have any of these problems. They have uh, the resources, they have more or less a trusted uh, brand. And with the influx of all of these specialist fintechs that are coming into the market, it will be quite easy for them 
to actually create a platform to offer these services to the consumer. And in fact, we see this happening. So we see Amazon moving into finance, for example, with um, uh, small to medium business lending on its platform. If you're a seller there, you're, you have an, um, access to a credit line. Apple providing credit cards. Google, this is one of the most interesting ones, Google um, opening up current accounts, uh, checking accounts in the US. And Facebook using peer-to-peer -peer payments as well as other fintech tools in order to start to create a peer-to-peer -peer type of fintech platform, allowing and targeting developing countries where most of the population has a phone, but they don't have a bank account. So peer-to-peer -peer actually is quite uh, crucial there. So overall, what we see is this, um, you know, uh, our research shows that uh, the future is going to include a lot more platforms in banking as well, although this is a highly regulated industry. This opening up, which was, you know, uh, through the data sharing regulation, actually creates a situation where not only startups, but also large entities are eyeing this sector. And so overall, what we see is this, uh, that uh, the platforms are on the rise in uh, banking as well. So I'll uh, stop sharing now. And this was uh, the last of the uh, last of the um, presentations. And we have um, about 10, 11 minutes uh, to for, for questions as well uh, for additional discussion. At this point in time, I'd like to also invite the panelists and, you know, again, thanking you for your contribution to give reactions to one another. Um, and I know that, you know, there were a, a few complimentary uh, presentations as well as a few kind of contradictory ones. So please feel free to also uh, unmute yourself and give reactions. I just I thought it's Simon Arbuth not speaking. I thought Michael, your comment about the um, the fact that the word platform is used in two different ways is very interesting. And Pino and I discussed that obviously before before the session. Um, while they have completely different uses, whether you're looking from the engineering point of view or from the mobility service point of view, uh, we have to cohabit in the same. Um, same economy or the same sector. So I think um, we're going to see, I'm sure we're going to see more and more convergence of those concepts than we'll see divergence. Absolutely. So Simon, I wanted to see, say that it's, I mean, basic economics are different, but they are causally connected. I'm, you know, I was, I was I made a similar point in some of my previous research, i.e. when you have a platform and the platform, the economics of the platform all of a sudden starts becoming efficient within your own set of operations, you move outside. Whether you are Amazon, you've created a platform that is interchangeable internally and externally, and then you're like, blimey, I'm going to have greater economies of scale, I'll open to third party sales. Whether you are Volkswagen and you are creating some technologies with significant fixed costs that will be able to have reuse, I think that one platform can lead to inter-organizational changes. Um, all I, I want agree. is that there is a risk that I sense of people simply not understanding that what they have in their mind is different. So platforms technologically leading to changes in division of labor, division of profit, absolutely, totally agree, and a fascinating question in and of itself, when and how this transition happens. Uh, but it's just that we have these technologically based platforms based in the economies of scale and learning and reuse. And then you have platforms that simply connect different actors that are driven by a different set of economics and a different set of management um, principles. They're both very interesting. They both are happening in the mobility sphere, but it's just that it's, it's, it's a bit of a trick of these words is the Humpty Dumpty problem that we have being uh, stuck with words that sometimes mean one thing, sometimes mean, mean another. Absolutely. And, you know, of course, we could we could discuss about about uh, the, the words and, you know, this is this is quite important. And, you know, we need to may maybe also bring the word ecosystem into into the picture to, yeah. to, to start to define some of these things. Um, I'm curious to also uh, maybe uh, ask uh, uh, Santosh for uh, his views, especially, you know, you have talked about platforms in a certain way. And then and then we heard from Simon about some of the ways that OEMs are, um, you know, uh, thinking about this world differently. And there's a cross section here in which uh, OEMs are now also realizing that the Ubers and the Grabs and the Olas of the world are potentially the future clients. And you know, this will affect the production of the, of, of the vehicle itself. Um, can I ask you, uh, both of you actually, Simon and Santosh, to comment on this as well? Santosh, go first. Sure, yeah, I think I completely agree with that in the sense that um, 
uh, well, when I was talking about the electrification point, which is sort of like the uh, next wave of technological advancement that's happening in the OEM space as it relates to cars, um, uh, ride ride share networks like Uber, Lyft, all of these are going to have like discussions with OEM makers because, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, these platforms which have like the economies of scale, which have like so many drivers driving across uh, different cities in the world are going to be the early adopters. So are going to shape what the next sort of uh, generation of these vehicles look like. Definitely. So, so, so there's definitely a synergy in that way, um, uh, which, which, which sort of feeds into both the businesses. I, I totally agree as well. Simon, again, I think that we're, you could build a, a scenario where the, the world of mass customization that we've seen in automotive um, over the last 20 to 30 years changes much more to this almost like the airline model where people like Uber specify the vehicles and the vehicles are built to, you know, there, there, there'll be an Uber spec, there'll be a lift spec of vehicles that the OEMs build in much the same way that um, the global airline airlines build, get certain specifications from Boeing or Boeing or Airbus and mass customization where you go and buy whatever you want, whatever color, might become something that actually slowly slowly disappears as OEMs are, are are meeting the requirements of a small number of very very powerful clients rather than a significant massively diverse group of 110 million consumers who are buying vehicles now exactly and a bit across sectors and inviting um shares and um, and also will uh, <coughs> If, if they like to the to the conversation, the role of data is not necessarily the same across these sectors. And so if maybe we can start with entertainment and, and discuss um, briefly what data means and what what data enables in, in your particular sector that you addressed. I can take that one. Um, the big thing to understand about data in music is for 70 years, we've had a business which was built on transactions. Pina buys a CD, Pina buys a download, and nobody knows what happens thereafter. Does she play the CD? Does she play it more than once? Does she play all the songs more than once? We just don't know. And now you've transitioned to a world where we monetize consumption. And by doing so, you actually get all the data on the consumption. So what was the source of stream? Was it from a playlist or Pina's commute to work playlist? Was it Discover Weekly? What time of day was she listening? What operating system was she listening on? I think that's the fascinating thing for music is, it's a business that's in recovery. It was the first to suffer and the first to recover. There's so much you can learn from that journey. But in addition to that, it's a business that actually knows how it's being consumed. If I pivot from music to the discussion around cars, it's fascinating to think about smart cars in terms of knowing how cars were being consumed. Knowing that X number of cars were sold last quarter is helpful. Knowing how those cars were consumed this quarter is far more helpful. So I can see an analogy there between the lessons that music can teach wider industries by going from transaction to consumption. I'll just build on that quickly. Well, I mean, that's so true. I mean, I'll go back to a paper I wrote with um, Raghu Garud um, and, and Aaron Komarsami on Timo on Tivo. And when Tivo came in, um, it was considered a pariah by the industry. And what it was trying to frame itself as, hey, we, we, we will give you exact measurement. We'll give you exact viewing details and this was way back in the in the late 90s well so it's, it's interesting that that logic of saying hey there's much more value we're not destroyers of the advertisement model that's how they tried to pitch themselves uh, initially to to counter counter to you know uh, deal with the counter lash they got from the uh, incumbents again napster was too aggressive in that and they didn't do that so it was one of the issues was can you can you show that value so that you can uh, show what customer uh, increasingly firms and customers are getting that value both sides. Thank you, Shaz. Um, Michael, um, the role of data in these across these industries. Can I get your comments? Sure. I mean, I think that what one of the things that we are seeing, and you know, there's been uh, some uh, banter to and fro in the chat as well in terms of the regulation. I've spent a fair amount of time looking at these uh, uh, questions the last few uh, weeks and months, I guess, um, is how um, organizations are trying to 
position themselves in terms of the ecosystem in order to be able to monetize the knowledge that they get from you. And that is one of the very big reasons why you see them do what they do. Um, so uh, what you may or may not know is that Google knows exactly what you're doing, what apps are open, what apps are not, when you're tired and when you're excited, and the targeting uh, that is provided that is either done by its own vertically integrated business uh, in terms of ad tech or sold uh, is something that comes this way. And, you know, as I was saying in another panel um, a couple of days ago, I think that the answer there is follow the money. Uh, and you can see that there is a very significant amount that is being made as a byproduct of usage. As a matter of fact, the number of even the mobility ecosystems or entertainment ecosystems do not make money on selling the products. They make money on understanding the customer, which then means there's going to be some way that they're going to make money, which means that they know what you want and when, which means that they're going to be well positioned to give it to you, which I think raises a number of these questions that we are starting to ask ourselves in terms of uh, regulation. And uh, what I was saying in, in the chat is that my sense is that as uh, people are starting to understand that this is not about an analogy to um, uh, the telco business that we've regulated in the past, but what is fair and what is not, what is invasive and what is not, needs a slightly better understanding of business models. My hope is that this community is going to do research that will inform the debate, because for the first time, uh, I see people who are interested in the regulatory issue, not just in terms of a strategy advice, to start asking questions. By the way, my concern, the reason I went into regulation is that I saw that part of the advice that I was giving uh, was potentially leading to dominance. I'm like, I don't want to burn in hell in terms of my feeling that we're supporting only one side and not the other. But, you know, more about that in a different forum, I guess. Thank you, Michael. And in fact, you know, our next forum where we uh, strongly encourage you to participate is, is, is about the regulatory and ethical issues. Now, um, Pinar, I, Pinar, may I just add one second only, just to build on Michael's point. It's not just the regulation, the, the exploitation can be through the algorithms. So for example, with Uber, it's not just the regulator is, but the way the algorithm is configured can uh, be disadvantages to drivers. And there has been a paper written on that and, and about how the algorithms themselves can have these effects beyond just the regulatory aspects unknowingly. So it's like affecting you in ways that you don't even know, but then you get affected by the way it's designed and, and, affect, and it's affecting your uh, work. Just wanted yeah. to happen. And in fact, there's some late research uh, showing about uh, nudges that platforms give and how those actually affect and change consumers, not only behavior, but also worldviews by, you know, giving them nudges at the right time, which is, which is a very interesting area. Santosh, do you want to comment on that? I think uh, with any algorithm, it's very important to make sure that there is uh, no bias. And I'm not gonna sit here and say that um, uh, the algorithms we have at Uber are perfect. That said, I can assure you, I, I can assure everyone on the panel that there is absolutely no intention to like um, have the kind of outcomes that might be uh, reported in some cases. Um, at the end of the day, you wanna uh, design your algorithm so that you do uh, the best for your clients, which in this case is riders and drivers, and also as a secondary client cities. Um, because if not, you sort of like, it, it's not it's not a monopolistic market that we're operating in. So if, if, it, if our product is not the best, we're not gonna survive. Um, so that's, that's what I'm gonna say, but uh, very, very important uh, point from Shaz that uh, algorithms can also lead to some of these issues that Michael was pointing to. Yeah. And in addition to the design, the, the training of the algorithm also highly depends on the data that is available and that is existing. And that actually is one of the ways in which these algorithms don't end up being perfect. But yes, both problems exist. Now we're two mi minutes past our allowed time. I want to give you a time to uh, stretch your legs and to get go get some coffee or whatever else you want to get. And we will be back here in exactly half an hour, more or less, at 3.45 UK time for the next panel with Annabelle. Thank you, everyone.